The world is a dangerous place, in part because of fools. There are many fools in the world, and fools are dangerous people to be identified and to be avoided, if at all possible. My name is Stephen Cook, and welcome to Thinking on Scripture. And today's uh, topic of discussion is going to be dealing with fools, because we're going to run into them, uh, and hopefully we can avoid being one. Uh, and the Word of God gives us what we need to know uh, to have wisdom, which is the opposite of being a fool. Uh, but it also gives us information on how to identify and deal with the fool. Now, Psalm chapter 14, verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, to say in his heart, this is something he says to himself. It is something that goes on in his stream of consciousness, in his own reasoning. And he says it in his heart, lave, L-E-B, but the bait lacks a dogish, so it sounds like it's a soft sound, so it's lave, but it speaks of the inner man, the inner person. It speaks of the thought processes. And what is it that he says in his heart? He says there is no God. That is, he rejects the true God, and he rejects the word of God. And so God and his word have no place in his thoughts. Now, he will put in substitute gods, and he may even set himself up as God. He may ultimately say there is no God. He may become an absolute atheist. But he denies the revelation of God through nature. He denies the revelation of God within himself, what Revelation 1, 18 through 20 calls the, the sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine, that intuitive sense of knowing that every person has that God exists. But once that person goes on negative volition, turns away from the Lord, says, I don't want to know you, I reject what light you have, uh, that person will then uh, put in other gods, will worship idols, substitutes, in place of the true and the living God. So the fool starts off with negative volition, and it starts off with something that he says to himself within his own reasoning, and that is that there is no God. Now today's lesson is going to be drawn primarily from the book of Proverbs as my source material. I will also cite Ecclesiastes. Uh, but Proverbs will be the primary base uh, that I will draw a lot of my quotes from. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and destruction. They despise wisdom and instruction. Now the Bible, especially Proverbs, contrasts the wise man with the fool. Wisdom, from the Hebrew word hokmah and the Greek word thophos, is the beneficial instruction for making, good, uh, for making good decisions that agree with God's Word. The Bible contrasts divine wisdom, which comes from God, and worldly wisdom, which ultimately comes from Satan. And we must realize that there is a worldly wisdom, and it is a, set, it is a philosophy and a set of values that is antithetical to God and to His Word. And Satan uh, provides a substitute. Remember, he wants to be like God, Isaiah 14 tells us. Now, he can't be God, but as God has wisdom, Satan wants to set forth his own wisdom. Those philosophies and values that <clears throat> permeate our culture, our academic institutions, our political institutions, our judicial system, uh, society as a whole, it comes to us from television, through literature, through music, through art. We see it all around us. And again, it is those philosophies and values that are antithetical to God and to his word. James tells us the ultimate source of this is Satan and is ultimately demonic in origin. He says in James 3.15, speaking of this pseudo-wisdom, this worldly wisdom, he says, this is wisdom is not that which comes down from above. Notice it is not from the source of, of God or from heaven, but what is its source? It is earthly, natural, demonic. And then he talks about some of the characteristics of this wisdom. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, and I see jealousy in people. It's a wicked, wicked, evil attitude and selfish ambition and I see this in a lot of politicians. I see this in a lot of business owners. A lot of people that are in leadership positions, it doesn't matter where they are, whether they're in the military or business or wherever. I see a lot of selfish ambition. But he says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above, that is from God, is first pure, then peaceable. It's gentle reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. It's beautiful. So the Bible contrasts divine wisdom, which comes from God, and worldly wisdom, which ultimately comes from Satan. 
Divine wisdom is the knowledge necessary to perform a task in conformity with God's Word. Biblical wisdom is based on God's revelation in the Bible and leads to moral uprightness. According to Proverbs 1.5, the wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. But Proverbs 1.7 tells us that fools despise wisdom and instruction. So let me pause here for just a moment. So with regard to the wise person, the wise person focuses on two things. First of all, the acquisition, uh, the obtaining of divine viewpoint, of wisdom from God's Word, and the application of it. So it's acquisition and application. And that's the way the Christian life is, isn't it? Because you cannot live what you do not know, and knowledge of God's Word necessarily precedes living God's will. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, the man who hears my words, there's the intake, the acquisition of divine viewpoint, and does them, there's application, is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the storms came, not if, but when they come, it will crash against that house and that house will stand because it is built on the foundation of God and his word. <clears throat> But again, in contrast to that, we have the fools despise wisdom and instruction, and they may even hear it. Jesus goes on in Matthew 7, he says, The man who hears my words and does not do them uh, is like a fool who built his house upon the sand, because he built it on something other than God, other than his word, and that's unstable ground. Now, the fool rejects the wisdom of God in Scripture, which leads to salvation and righteous living. The fool is friendly toward the world and its philosophies and values that promote human wisdom and accomplishments. According to J. Dwight Pentecost, and I love Dr. Pentecost, and I highly, highly recommend his books. If you can get them, you will be blessed by them. According to J. Dwight Pentecost, he says, quote, A fool is not necessarily one who is marked by a low IQ, but one who leaves God out of his consciousness. The fool is the man who does not take God into consideration in every area of his life, end quote. And he's absolutely right. And I've, I've seen people that would, meet, that would meet the qualification of a fool, uh, not for want of education. They may have a PhD. They may be very, very academically uh, trained. And yet God, the true God and his word, are nowhere in their thoughts. They will talk about anything and everything except any serious discussion of God and His Word. And I hear this, I can watch the news, I can watch discussions amongst politicians and news commentators and academicians and so on, business owners, and they will talk about all sorts of problems in life and they'll talk about all sorts of solutions, but they will not seriously bring God or His Word into the discussion. And the wise person is the person who brings God into every aspect of his life. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about your political views, your, 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 your business ethics, your finances, your marriage, how you treat your parents, how you treat your children, how you treat your siblings, how you treat your neighbors, how you, how you serve as a coach or a leader in an organization, whether you're a captain in the police department or a colonel in the military or wherever it is that you happen to be, whether you're a teacher in the classroom, you, you, you bring God into everything in your life. And you are able to frame life from the divine perspective, which gives you insight into realities that you could never know except that God has spoken. And his word pulls, his word pulls back the curtain and gives us glimpses into the heavenly realm, into who is God, what is his word, what are his promises, that there are holy angels that are serving as ministers in the world, that there are unholy angels, Satan, demons, evil spirits, wicked spirits, whatever you want to call them, that they are working behind the scenes to drive a lot of what we see going on politically, culturally, socially, and so so on. And the Word of God gives you that insight, and you understand, and you see what's going on, and you are able to see it clearly because the Word of God gives you that insight. So again, citing Pentecost here, he says, a fool is not necessarily one who is marked by a low IQ, but one who leaves God out of his consciousness. The fool is the man who does not take God into consideration in every area of his life. And according to Merrill F. Unger, and here I'm drawing from his um, definition of a fool from Unger's Bible Dictionary, which is also a book that I highly recommend, he says, quote, the word fool is used in Scripture with respect to moral more than intellectual deficiencies. 
He goes on, he says, the fool is not so much one lacking in mental powers as much as, as one who misuses them, not one who does not reason, but reasons wrongly. In scripture, he goes on to say, the fool primarily is the person who casts off the fear of God and thinks and acts as if he could disregard, who, who, and who thinks and acts as if he could safely disregard the eternal principles of God's righteousness. Yet in many passages, especially in Proverbs, the term has its ordinary use and denotes one who is rash, senseless, and unreasonable, end quote. Now, the fool, according to Solomon, is a fool by choice and never by chance. The fool is a fool by choice and never by chance. This is true for the wise person as well. And so the fool starts with negative volition in which he rejects uh, God. He rejects the revelation of God through nature which Psalm 19, 1 and 2 make very clear. Psalm 118 says God is seen through the creation. And what happens is, is when the heart goes negative and says, I don't want to know you, God, then the heart will then seek to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Will seek to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And there's nothing wrong with the truth. In fact, uh, he go, Paul goes on, he talks about how, how, how God is made evident within them. He's clearly seen within them because God made himself evident within them. What in theology we call the sensus divinitatis, or the sense of the divine, the intuitive sense of knowing that God exists. And so when the fool goes negative, the fool then will reject God, reject his word, and then will enter into all sorts of human wisdom that is antithetical to the wisdom of God. I hate to even use, use it wisdom, except that the Bible talks about a worldly, natural, demonic wisdom. That's how the Bible describes it. So I'll use their language in that way. And so they reject the idea that God exists, that there's an intelligent designer behind the design and the creation of the universe, that God created the universe in six days, that he created the earth, that he formed the earth, that he created the, the universe, excuse me, in a moment in time, that he formed the earth over six days with man being the culmination of that, that we are special, that we are made in the image of God, the Imago Dei, and that we are special among all God's creation, because unlike the rest of the world, uh, which is beautiful, again, by divine design, it's amazing to look at, and you can see God through the creation. It just screams God and the glory of God. But mankind is special. We, are, we have the ability to think and to feel and to act, and we have consciousness and self-consciousness, and we operate by norms and standards, and to look at the complexity of the of the human being and the function of the mind is just brilliant. It's just amazing, amazing, this creation, this body that we have and this soul that we have. And so the fool rejects all that and he says, oh no, there is no God, big bang, 13.8 billion years ago, everything's the product of matter, motion, time, and chance. We're just the accidental collection of molecules, evolving bags of protoplasm, that we come from the goo to the zoo uh, to you, uh, that man comes from nothing significant, he goes to nothing significant, man is nothing significant, he's a zero, and it destroys all basis for morality because you have nothing beyond yourself to say anything is right or anything is wrong, and you're left purely with arbitrary norms and standards. And so you have no basis upon which to declare anything is absolutely right or absolutely wrong. Really to, to talk about, well, you should do this, you should do that, I don't like this, I don't like that. If there's no absolute moral lawgiver behind your moral claims, then really what you're doing is you're just telling me your personal likes and dislikes. You're just giving me a psychology report. That's all you're doing. And I can take that or leave that. <laughs> and so... The fool, according to Solomon, is, is a fool by choice and never by chance. And there's always, always uh, consequences to that. By the way, he can stop being a fool anytime he's ready to learn and apply God's word. And he makes himself a fool by the way he thinks and is identified as a fool by the way he speaks and by his behavior. And so the word of God is instructive to us. It is helpful to us because it helps us to understand why the fool is a fool, but it helps us to understand and identify the fool by his speech and by his behavior. Now, we don't hate the fool, but at the same time, we have to be careful to be guarded against the fool because the fool can be quite harmful. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. The companion of fools will suffer harm. You associate with fools. Be careful who your friends are. Because if you associate with fools, you will pay a price, sometimes a very heavy price. So the fool makes himself uh, so by the way he thinks and is identified as a fool by the way he speaks and by his behavior. 
Over time, folly can become so ingrained into a person that neither kindness nor suffering can remove it. It can, can become so ingrained in a person that neither kindness, you can be kind to them, you can, you can treat them harshly, it doesn't matter. It just, it cannot be removed from them. Now, here are some biblical facts about the fool. And I've taken these and we'll be citing Proverbs throughout and maybe a few from Ecclesiastes as well. So first of all, and this is the first starting point, and that is that the fool is a fool by choice and never by chance. The fool is a fool by choice and never by chance. Solomon says in Proverbs 122, How long, O naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. And the question implies that they can turn from that at any time. Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. And so he can stop being a fool any time he's ready to learn and apply God's word. Point number two, the fool can be recognized by his outward behavior. Now, this is helpful to us because when we're looking around, we can classify people and we naturally classify people. We have categories in our minds. We have visual categories of things in the creation. We have concepts in our minds. But as we begin to develop language and vocabulary, um, we create these various categories. And so the Bible helps us to create these categories. So we have a, a category called wise and we have a category called fools. And under those, under those headings, we have uh, various listings, things that we can look at. But the Bible gives us that insight into how to uh, identify the fool, to know something about the fool so that we can avoid danger but there's something outward about his behavior that is that one can look at and say, that's a fool. And speaking very generally here, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 10.3, he says, even when the fool walks along the road. So I imagine Solomon's up in his, in his house, maybe in his, uh, in his palace, and he's looking down on the street and he sees some guy walking down the sidewalk. And there's something about this man that Solomon can look at and say, that's a fool. He says, even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking. And he demonstrates to everyone, notice it's on display, it's not just for him, but for everyone, that he is a what? A fool. Now, I wish that Solomon had elaborated here. Was it something in his entire, in, in his dress, in his attire? Was it something in his mannerisms? Could he hear him say something? Was he singing a song? I don't know. Solomon doesn't give us that. But the point is, it's just that there was something outward in his behavior that Solomon says, that man's a fool. Now, he's not condemning him. He's just classifying him. And we want to be careful here because we don't want to become prideful. We want to be humble. We want to look at these people as made in the image of God, albeit they're set, they've set their will against the will of God, and they've rejected him, but still, they're image bearers. They still have that within them, and they are to be prayed for, and, they are, and if you have the opportunity to speak truth and love, do so, but also realize that there's times where keeping your mouth shut is wisdom. I'll talk about that here in just a moment. So even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everybody that he's a fool. Point number three, now we get into speech. So the fool loves to slander others. Proverbs 10, 18 says, He who conceals hatred has lying lips, and he who spreads slander is a fool. He who spreads slander is a fool. Now, slander is the intentional circulation of a falsehood about another for the purpose of destroying their character. It's called character assassination. It's evil, evil business. And you see it in politics. You see it in the business world. You see it in a lot of different circles. You see it in the academic institutions. You see it everywhere. So again, one thing that's about a fool is that he who conceals hatred has lying lips and he who spreads slander is a fool. So you see somebody spreading slander or you know, being, uh, engaging in slanderous speech, you say, well, that's a fool. That's foolish behavior. Point number four, wickedness is like game, is like a game to the fool. And it thrills him to do evil. It thrills him to do evil, to think of it this way. Proverbs 10, 23 says, doing wickedness is like sport to a fool. Uh, and so is wisdom to a man of understanding. So we have the flip side to that. So just as doing wickedness is like sport to a fool, he's passionate about it. He's, he's zealous about it. Well, so is wisdom to a man of understanding. I get fired up about the Word of God. I love the Word of God. I love getting into it. I love having theological discussions. It's enlightening. It's invigorating. It rejuvenates me. 
It helps me to live life to the best. My goodness. Point number five, children are naturally bent towards foolishness and the loving parent seeks to discipline it out of them. I see a baby, I see a cute little baby, yeah, made in the image of God, cute, a lot of potential there, but I see a little bundle of sin in that little bologna loaf. Um, and I realize that there's just as much of a potential for that little child to grow up, in one sense, to be an Apostle Paul as to grow up and be an Adolf Hitler or a Joseph Stalin. That's, that's the potential bound up in that little child right there. And the natural proclivity of a child because of our sinful nature is towards sin and foolishness. And the loving parent who loves their children says, yes, beautiful, cuddly, made in the image of God, you beautiful little bundle of joy, but also recognizes at a very early age that children uh, think only of themselves and they live only in the moment and they, and they do not have to be taught to lie or to be selfish or manipulative because that's the default setting. And so they have to be taught to be loving, to be honest, to be truthful, to be moral, to have integrity. Proverbs 21, 22, 15, Solomon says, Foolishness is bound, in the, is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs 29, 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Now, I was of that generation back in the mid-70s when I grew up in Southern California in Lancaster. I remember going to Linda Verde Elementary, and there was a, there was a wood... There was a... Um, a paddle on the wall. The principal kept it up on the wall for display. And I got called into the principal's office because I was that child. <laughs> I was a little troublemaker. Um, and I didn't have much parental uh, guidance at the time. And so it came from other places. My grandmother, most notably, who was a, a loving disciplinary agent in my life. And Lord knows I needed that. Boy, did I need that. But I, I was one of those children that went to the principal's office and got spanked, and I deserved, I deserved a lot more than what I got, let me tell you. But uh, the scripture teaches that, that that can be a means of dealing, and not just punishment, please understand, it must always be done measured, must always be done in love, must always be done uh, only when needed as a last resort. There are people that always take this to the extreme, and of course then you have some people that say, well, you should never, never spank a child. Um, I disagree with that. I grew up, uh, I had a, um, in fact, when I, one time when I was a young boy, um, uh, had a neighbor, a young boy, a young man who was about 16, 17 years of age, and his father used to abuse him with a cattle prod. And he had scars that ran up and down his back because he would have to stand against the wall while his dad shocked him. What kind of father is that? That's a monster. That's what that is. There's no love there. That's just that's just abuse. And so, you know, again, those sorts of extreme, that's just that's just craziness there. But discipline, whether that and my grandmother, she was she started soft. She started well, she was a good disciplinary agent because when I was a young boy, if I was doing something out of line, oh, well, she'd grab me by the earlobe, walk me down the hallway, or she'd pinch you on the back of the arm. Boy, that was an attention getter, let me tell you what. Her little pinching fingers, she'd pinch you on the back of the arm, and you were walking down the hallway with Grandma. You knew, because she was directing the ship at that point. And then it would ramp up. She'd pull out her little 18-inch or, you know, three-foot ruler, and she'd whack you across the back of your hand. She'd flat hand you. Boom! She'd smack you good. And you had to hold your hand out there, you know, so you had to, you had to endure it. And she would ramp up. But her discipline was always in love, you see. And she understood these verses, and so she was seeking to drive that from us. So that's the kind of discipline that is being spoken of here, not, not the other kind of evil abuses that you see going on. So you must always take Scripture um, uh, for, for what it says, and not, not in the abusive ways that some sinful people seek to pervert it. Point number six, the foolish child rejects his parents' discipline. So there's something in the heart of the child that can uh, not respond to that. I did. I did respond to that. I needed that. I knew I needed that because I knew when I did wrong and I knew when I deserved it. But the foolish child rejects his parents' discipline. Proverbs 15.5 says, A fool rejects his father's discipline. But he who regards reproof is sensible. Point number seven, over time, as the fool becomes an adult, his folly becomes entrenched in his heart and he is very resistant to any external pressures to change. 
Notice Proverbs 17.10, a rebuke goes deeper into one who has understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. A rebuke goes deeper into one who has understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. And I know some people say, I'll beat that foolishness out of you. You don't understand folly. If that's what you think, you don't understand folly. Because there's a point where it can become so deeply entrenched in that person that no external pressure, be it, be it, be it tough or kind, can remove that. Proverbs 17, 22, Solomon says, Though you pound a fool in a mortar with a pestle, along with crushed grain, yet his foolishness will not depart from him. Think of it, if you could crush him down to a fine uh, little powder, you still, his foolishness will not depart from him. And if he were writing today, you would say, down at the molecular level, down at the, at the level of, of, of their genetic makeup, foolishness is, is bound in there. And so this is another truth with regard to some who pursue a path of folly that it can become so entrenched in that person that nothing can remove it. Nothing can remove it. And, and again, I think of other passages. I think of when Jesus was in the world, and I gave this in another lesson. But you think of Jesus coming into the world. He is the perfect display of truth and love and grace and righteousness and mercy and all that is good. And John 1, 14, and, and, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And yet, John 1, 11 tells us that He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. John 3, 19 says, And the light came into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, Jesus says, you, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. And you have John 12, 37, which says, And though he performed so many signs among them, yet they were not believing. And so here is the perfect display of truth and love and righteousness and goodness. And he healed the sick and raised the dead and caused the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. And he did all these wonderful miracles and spoke truth. And yet the majority of those who heard and saw him rejected him. That's just foolishness. That's an evil heart. That is a heart that is set against God. And when the person, and remember, at the heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. And that's why I started with the first one, that negative volition really is at the heart of foolishness. Foolishness. And, and here is Jesus, again, on perfect display, and yet the majority of those who heard and saw him rejected him. And that was their choice. God is a perfect gentleman. He does not force himself upon anybody. And he lets them go their own way. You see that in Romans 1, where those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, three times it says, God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. He says, all right, you want to go down that rabbit hole? I'll let you. There's consequences. But I will let you. If you want that, that's, that's your choice. And so this is something that is permitted. But my point is, is that once somebody starts going down that path, there's a point where they can become so deeply ingrained in who they are that there's a point of no return. There's a point of no return, and I don't know when that is. God knows, but there is a point of no return. And so again, though you pound a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his foolishness will not depart from him. Point number eight, the fool is a grief to his father and mother. Proverbs 10.1 says, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. Proverbs 17, 21 says, He who sires a fool does so to his sorrow, and the father of a fool has no joy. That's sad. Point number nine, the fool ruins his own life and fights against God. He ruins his own life. He's the product of his own choices. And choices matter. Listen, choices matter because uh, actions are followed by consequences. And so the fool ruins his own life and fights against God. God, Proverbs 19.3 says, The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. Again, the foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. Point number 10, fools like to argue with others without a just cause. 
Proverbs 20, verse 3 says, Keeping away from strife is an honor for any man, is an honor for a man, but any fool will quarrel. Any fool will quarrel. Now listen, in opposition, in, in the opposite of that, I think of uh, 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and 25, which I've cited many times, and it says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So again, keeping away from strife is an honor for any man, but any fool will quarrel. And it's better to avoid the fool rather than pursue conflict with him. Once you identify, listen, there's the wisdom here. It's better to avoid the fool than to pursue conflict with him. Proverbs 29 verse 9 says, When a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, so when the two come into conflict with each other and there is a controversy, when a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, the foolish man either rages in anger or he laughs, ah, the wicked laughter. But either way, there is no rest. There is no rest. Point number 11, fools are arrogant and often storm through life without consideration of others. Proverbs 14, 16 says a wise man is cautious He's cautious and he turns from evil. He sees evil and he turns from that. But a fool is arrogant and careless. Point number 12, those who employ a fool. So this is the business owner here. (laughs) Those who employ a fool feel the painful effects of his stupidity. Proverbs 26 verse 10 says, Like an archer who wounds everyone, so is he who hires a fool or who hires those who pass by. So like an archer who wounds everybody, you just start shooting and just start shooting at everybody, taking out friends and (laughs) and foe. So is he who hires a fool, says Proverbs 26.10. Point number 13, fools repeat the same ugly acts over and over again. So there's repetition to their their behavior. Proverbs 26.11 says, like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Point number 14, fools have no control over their emotions. They have no control over their emotions. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. A wise man holds it back because the wise man is governed by wisdom. You see, he operates by divine viewpoint, not feelings. He operates by faith in God and his word, not by feelings. Now, I love my feelings. Feelings are wonderful. They're a gift from God. I enjoy them very much. But living in a fallen world with a fallen nature, my feelings are not always my friends. And so I must be governed by wisdom and walk by faith, not feelings. So a fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. There may be a fire and a storm raging, but the wise man checks that. Point number 15, fools pursue worldly pleasure and ruin themselves. They pursue worldly pleasure and they ruin themselves. Ecclesiastes 7.4 says, The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. And I'm here to tell you, I spent many years of my life as a fool. Just a fool. There's no other way to put it. When, When my grandmother got out of my home and that light left my world that was there for a brief period, for about two years. When she left, I was surrounded by darkness. And all of the values from my parents to my uncles to my cousins to my friends to everybody to everything, the TV shows, the music, the literature, the art, everything was just worldly pagan viewpoint. And it just came at me at a young age. And I fell into that, and my parents moved to, uh, well, they separated, and my father moved to Vegas in 1980, and my mom followed shortly thereafter, and we were in Vegas for 10 years, and I had no parental supervision, and I followed in the ways of the world. And I got caught up in it, in the partying, in the drugs, in the crime, in the self-destruction. Dropped out of school in the 10th grade, became homeless, suicidal for a year. Man, the world was a dark, dark place to me, and I brought myself there. I was my—I was the product of my own stupid choices. 
And at an early age, I could say, well, I didn't know better. But I think about 13, I think I, I think I started to know better. And at that point, I was responsible for this life. And I was making bad choices. And at that point, I can't I can't blame anybody else. I mean, they may bear their own consequences their, or their own uh, consequences for their decisions to influence this life, whoever they are, wherever they are. But ultimately, I have to own this life. And I have to be responsible for this. And and it nearly destroyed me. And I was not like the wise in the house of mourning. No, no. I was like the fool who spent all of his time in the house of pleasure. Point number 16. But thank God, <laughs> he brought me down. He whom the Lord loves, he disciplines like a father, his own son. And he humbled me. And I needed it. Boy, did I need it. And I turned to him. I did. I turned to him. I cried out to the Lord. And the wisdom that my grandmother, the seeds that she planted in my in my young mind at a young age, came to came to light, and I began to think upon scripture, think upon scripture, and I've been thinking on scripture ever since. And I spend my days thinking on scripture. <laughs> it is so much of what defines me, that thinking on scripture. And God lifted me from the ash heap of my own ruin, and he brought me out. Because the Lord who brings low is also the God who exalts, Hannah says in her wonderful, wonderful prayer in Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2. If you've never read the prayer of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2, read it. She was genius, brilliant, tremendous theological mind, the mother of Samuel. And her prayer, oh, there is so much wisdom in that prayer. One of the great prayers of the Bible. Hannah's prayer for Samuel 2. God brings low, he also exalts. Wonderful. Just wonderful. And he did that with me. <laughs> oh, he has blessed me. I am so thankful. <laughs> God has been so good to me. Um, so let's move on with this. Point number 16, the words of the wise are gracious, whereas the words of, of, of the fool express wickedness. Ecclesiastes 10 verses 12 and 13, it says, words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, gracious while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. Point number 17, the person who befriends a fool, uh, the person who befriends a fool causes himself harm. What's the saying? The one who befriends a fool will end a fool. The one who befriends a fool will end a fool. And he really brings himself harm. Proverbs uh, thirteen twenty. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Save yourself. Learn who the fools are. Be wise. Identify them. See them. Pray for them. Love them. Speak the truth when you can, when they're willing to listen. But also learn to avoid them. Certainly don't call them your close friend. Now, if they change and, and pursue wisdom, then yes, invite them in. But until then, keep some distance. You'll save yourself some heartache. So let's talk about dealing with the fool. And this will close out this lesson for today. Let's talk about dealing with the fool because there are, there are certain passages in Proverbs that Solomon sets forth that has to do with how we deal with the fool. So once we've identified them, these are then our operating orders our directive. So wise men often do not answer the fool because one, he's not teachable. And though there are times that the fool needs to be corrected, though there are times that the fool needs to be corrected so that his false estimation of himself does not go unchecked, wise men will leave the presence of the fool as there is no benefit to his company. And one, when one encounters a fool, there are several things that one should do depending upon the encounter. So you have to have some wisdom to apply to the situation. Point number one, once a fool is identified, do not provoke him or you will bring harm, uh, you will bring grief on yourself. Uh, Proverbs 23, 27 verse 3 says, a stone is heavy and the sand weighty, but the provocation of a fool is heavier than both of them. The provocation of a fool is heavier than both of them. Do not provoke the fool. Point number two, avoid speaking in the presence of a fool, or at least keep your words few. 
Proverbs 23, verse 9, Solomon tells us, Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. Fools despise wisdom, so they despise those who speak and live by wisdom. Point number three, don't answer the fool in the midst of his foolishness. Proverbs 26, 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will also be like him. So it is foolish to try to correct the fool. It is foolish to try to correct the fool. What must happen is, is he must be broken. He must be broken. And there must be humility present before there will be a change. There must be humility present. So when you see humility, then you can come in. Then you can speak to that. And I have somebody that I have known for many, many, many years, decades. And he is, I would regard, a fool. Now, we have conversations, and he calls, and he complains, and he tells me about life. And many, many, many years ago, I used to seek to try to counsel him, only to have him get angry at me. Oh, he would get all fired up. Why are you coming at me with the Word of God? What are you, what are you, what are you, what are you doing that? And I used to get angry at him, and I'd shout back at him and say, what do you expect from me? You know, I'm a Christian. I live and breathe the Word of God. You know, I want it to be a part of my life. And so you come to me with your problems. Naturally, I'm going to provide a solution born out of the Word of God. You don't want to hear it? Don't call me. <laughs> don't talk to me. Um, but uh, I've just gotten to the point to where uh, in the conversation, I just realize until I see humility, I don't offer any counsel. I really don't. I pray for him. And, uh, but our conversations are very, very, very limited, and our relationship is very, very small. Uh, and again, it has to do with his being folly, and it's just simply because he's not receptive to it. He's not receptive to it. Point number four, there are times to address the fool so that he does not think himself why. So there are times, and this is where Solomon goes back and forth here. So whereas in Proverbs 26, 4, he says, do not answer a fool. In Proverbs 26, 5, he says, answer a fool. So what's the difference? Yes, <laughs> it's not always easily discernible. But there are times that you do not answer a fool. And then there are times where Solomon says, answer a fool as his folly deserves, that he not be wise in his own eyes. Now, this type of correction does not seek to correct the fool but only his false estimation of himself. And wisdom discerns when to answer the fool. Wisdom discerns when to answer the fool. And lastly, make the conscious decision to leave the presence of the fool so that you are not infected by his folly. Proverbs 14, 7 says, Leave the presence of a fool. Leave the presence of a fool. Or you will not discern wisdom, words of knowledge because you can become infected by that. Listen, bad associations corrupts good morals, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. So this is because Proverbs 14, 8 tells us that the foolishness of fools is deceit and there is no truth in their speech. So those are some of the ways that we can deal with the fool. So this has been a short lesson. I hope that this has been helpful to you, that it has provided some blessing to you. If you did like this lesson, please hit the like button below. And if you would like to receive more like this, then please be sure to subscribe to my channel. I thank you very much and I wish you a blessed day.